go and introduce. We have a virtual briefing with the title Current and Planned Research on Agriculture for Improved Nutrition, a Mapping and a Gap Analysis. And the two presenters today are Rachel Lambert and Alan Dangor. Rachel is a senior advisor in the agriculture research team of DFID and is involved in uh, commissioning agriculture research from advanced science to more operational research in rural compacts. And then we have Alan, who's interested in nutrition at uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the role of agriculture and nutrition outcomes. He's a senior research fellow uh, on agriculture research at DFID. If I don't want to take it too long, I just hand over to the two presenters and uh, start their presentation, please. Great. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. I, um, I'm going to talk to the first few slides and then hand over to Rachel. Um, so, when uh, so this is a piece of research that was conducted was commissioned by DFID. Um, Rachel and I wrote the terms of reference. It was sent out for tender. Um, and the groups at the bottom there, the Liebigen Center for Integrative Research on Agriculture and Health and the University of Aberdeen were the two, uh, were the two groups of uh, academics that were involved in writing this analysis uh, and doing the mapping and writing the analysis. So here we're presenting some results. Uh, uh, they're quite informative and they're very helpful um, thinking about the uh, future uh, in this area. So um, this is a potentially very important area, uh, especially with, when we're talking about food and, uh, and nutrition security, um, and potentially also uh, going forward, there's a, obviously a great deal of interest in agriculture and the potential for agriculture to have important impacts for nutrition outcomes and health outcomes in poor countries. So there is potentially a, a lot of, a, a great role for agriculture to, to play in improving nutrition outcomes, and those can be both directly uh, that would mean, for example, uh, smallholders or, or farmers producing uh, nutritionally enhanced crops which would directly improve the quality of the food or a, or a more diverse uh, number of crops which would, directly, uh, which would directly improve the quality of the diet in households. So that would be the direct impact of agriculture. But also there's a potential for indirect uh, benefits, for example, uh, agricultural uh, development would lead, lead to, is also lead to economic development in countries, and of course that can lead to improved wealth and, and, and health of populations. So there are both direct and indirect routes, and there's a potential enormous role. Unfortunately, the systematic reviews that have been conducted, which have largely focused on the direct impacts of agricultural innovations and agricultural change on nutrition outcomes, um, have suggested that, that there's very little evidence of a benefit, evidence of impact. So those two reviews were published in the last couple of years. Uh, the review by Masse was commissioned by DFID, and there was then a subsequent review by Webb Girard uh, published uh, earlier this year, uh, which showed that there have, while there have been a lot of studies which have looked, or a fair number of studies anyway, that have looked at the impact of agriculture on nutrition outcomes, actually the evidence is very limited, and the evidence of benefit is, is, is small. Um, one of the things that's come out of both of those studies uh, is, is the realization that a lot of the research that has been conducted up till now had been uh, not, very, uh, not very well thought through, um, also not very well uh, conducted from, a, from an epidemiological perspective. So this is agriculture research uh, conducted, or a little bit of nutrition research largely conducted by agriculturalists, and it hasn't been very well done. So there's clearly uh, a need to uh, more closely embed the research techniques from different disciplines to try and answer this important question. But before deciding which research questions to answer, where the areas where there would be the, uh, the largest amount of evidence is needed, uh, DFID decided that it would be a sensible thing to do to map the ongoing research to inform uh, future research uh, and funding decisions. So DFID commissioned a, uh, a mapping and a gap analysis um, on current and, and planned uh, research that links agriculture with nutrition. Um, this is, uh, uh, and the decision was to use the systematic reviews as the basis for what's already been done, and that this should be a map of what's currently being done or what will be planned to, to be done in the next few years. To look at all of that in totality, to identify the, 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 the breadth of the research that's currently, been going, currently being planned or being conducted, 
and then to identify where there was a lot of research and where there was less research, and identify where potentially some research should be funded and should be conducted. So there were three sub-objectives. One was to develop a coherent framework linking agriculture with nutrition. And the second was to improve, to, to think about how to improve the quality of the research that's being conducted. And the third was to identify the priority themes for future research and funding. The teams that conducted this research had a six-stage uh, methods, uh, which I'm not going to go into any detail, but the first was to conduct a, to, to, to draw out the conceptual framework, then was to, uh, to define the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the research to be included in the mapping, then to identify the relevant projects to, population, to populate a very complicated data template, then to classify the projects, and then to, uh, to conduct a gap analysis. So moving to the first of those, uh, the conceptual framework. There was a lot of effort went into drawing up this conceptual framework. And, and there have been many conceptual frameworks linking agriculture with nutrition outcomes. But this one is really the first one that put nutrition at the center of the, uh, of, of the framework. Really said, you know, what we're really interested in doing here is improving nutritional status. Let's put nutritional status of women and children and, uh, and men uh, in, in, the middle of the, in the middle of the framework. And I'll just walk you through the framework. It's uh, in the, on the green, the green column, that's agricultural interventions and practices. The yellow column are the impacts, the, uh, the nutrition, uh, food, and, and food environment. And the, and the orangey column on the right-hand side are the indirect impacts and the intervening factors. So if we walk through, you could imagine that an agricultural input might improve or change an agricultural practice, which could potentially change the uh, the food value chain. So that's uh, the quality of the food as it moves through the food value chain. The agricultural practices might directly change food consumption practices, or the agricultural practices might indirectly, if you see the long arrow that goes to the, the orange column at the bottom there, uh, change economic outcomes of households. So improving the yield might lead to more uh, of, the product, of, the, of the product being sold in the market, which might improve the economic outcomes of the household whilst changing the diversity of the yield might change uh, practices of uh, food consumption practices. The food value chain uh, box then leads into changing in the food environment. Changes in the food environment might potentially lead to changes in food consumption patterns. And food consumption pa patterns, we would theorize, would have benefits for new or change, would might change nutritional status. But then also moving to the right-hand column, changes in the economic outcomes of households and populations, uh, could lay, change to changes in healthcare and education, both the availability of healthcare and education, but also the uptake and the use of those things. And those might lead to changes in health, the education status and well-being, which might, of course, have a feedback into nutritional status. So you can see that there, this, this framework looks at both the direct routes from agricultural inputs into nutritional status and the indirect routes from agricultural inputs through economic outcomes to nutritional status. And surrounding those boxes, you have the, the sort of wider questions of policy and governance, culture, gender and equity, political and e economic context, and climate and environment. So a, an all-encompassing framework, really, but one that specifically makes, makes, takes a look at both the direct and the indirect routes. So the inclusion and exclusion criteria, what studies were included and what studies weren't included, they, the, the team took a took a clear focus on developing country research uh, and research that had a, a stated objective to improve nutritional outcomes. There had to be an agricultural component, clearly, and the, and the research needed to, uh, to include an assessment of the relationship between agriculture and measures of food consumption or nutritional status. So a real effort to, 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 to measure the impact of the agriculture agricultural intervention on nutrition outcomes. Things that were excluded were studies where there was foods with no agricultural components, so uh, the provision of a food or the provision of a fortified food, for example, with no agricultural components directly. Uh, the team excluded zoonotic, uh, studies on zoonotic diseases and other agricultural associated diseases, although studies on aflatoxins were included because of a particular different interest. And then the other things that were excluded were the basic science research, the sort of bench science on, on animal and plant breeding. 
The team then went to great lengths to identify relevant projects. There was an advisory panel with members of the CTIR, the Agriculture for Nutrition and Health, uh, uh, USAID, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. There were members of uh, IARD and other donors were contacted. There's an Agriculture and Nutrition Community of Practice, which is hosted by the uh, Standing Committee on Nutrition. Uh, they contacted the maternal health research community. They, there's a university network on agriculture and health, uh, which was which was uh, canvassed. Uh, there was some database searching, and of course there was snowballing. People told people about other studies. So 135 institutions were identified as potentially relevant um, to contact um, as as institutions that might be conducting this sort of research. And of those 135, 131 were contacted. And those contacts led to a list of 151 current or planned studies which were relevant and met the inclusion criteria. Those were studies then that looked at the at nutrition uh, uh, outcomes of agricultural intervention. So moving to the results, um, it was. Uh, uh, there were 46 different funders funded this sort of research, but the predominant, you know, the five big funders were the Gates Foundation, Canadian CEDA, USAID, IDRC, and of course DFID. Um, and who, were con who was conducting the research? Well, a lot, thankfully, a lot of the research is being conducted by the CGIR centers, but also universities and NGOs were common leaders of the research. When you look at uh, within each project, who was actually the lead? Well, it was largely led by developed countries, so universities in developed countries or academics from developed countries. And there were also very few private sector partners, so this was largely a public sector uh, uh, donor-driven activity. Where is the research being conducted? Uh, well, the majority of the research is being conducted in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Um, uh, and then a few other countries as well. But the uh, vast majority of the research, as you see from the slide, was being conducted uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Who were the target groups? Well, much of the research was focused on children, especially young children in the first thousand days of their life. There was a focus also on women, especially women of reproductive age. Uh, rural households received a lot of attention and very poor households. There was significantly less coverage of research that focused on men or indeed research on urban households. What type of research was being conducted? Well, 60% of the research was active interventions into agriculture, the evaluations of agricultural development projects or new interventions, the impact of, of, of specific agricultural interventions. There was also quite a lot of research on analyzing large data sets on agriculture and nutrition uh, and on creating new data sets on agriculture and nutrition. So some primary analysis, some primary research, and also some secondary research. And the focus of those research questions uh, most often was on uh, directed at improving the production of nutritious foods. So way um, of fortification, other crop improvements, the use of indigenous, traditional local foods, and agrobiodiversity. So what are the agricultural interventions, what are the impacts of agricultural interventions that improve the production of nutritious foods on nutrition outcomes? And the other common area uh, was on, other common areas were on uh, the focus on the food value chains and also on um, agricultural growth and development, although they were uh, 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 less frequently being researched. So that's the, those are the findings of the, of the mapping. Um, now there's a, uh, then the next stage was of course the gap analysis, and I'm going to hand over to Rachel for the talking through the few slides on gap analysis. Thanks, Alan. Um, so the, the gap analysis was based on that uh, conceptual framework that Alan presented earlier, uh, and looked at tried to identify gaps um, both through research chains and looking along impact pathways. Uh, and looking at the kind of nutritional effects. It looked at both the macro factors involved in the research and, and looked at the, the target groups. Uh, and it identified uh, eight, I think, um, areas that it felt was a gap, remembering that this is not just in past research, but it's also looking at research that's planned over the next five years or so. So it's giving us a sense of, of both, both forward and, and backward looking. 
So the first area was a, a, a gap in terms of research looking at the whole research trait chain, i.e. From, from agriculture through to nutrition. So that kind of comprehensive, more systematic approach uh, in terms of what happens along that, that chain. Um, the second area it identified was uh, the indirect effects on nutrition. So we saw in that conceptual framework the links between consumption and the direct pathway between um, food consumption and, and production type approaches leading into impacts on nutrition, but far less has been looking at the, the links through, uh, through incomes and through economic growth, so both micro and macro. There's relatively little on the effects of agricultural policy on nutrition, um, so agricultural policy, food, food systems policy, food policy, uh, that whole area is, is under-researched and, and uh, poorly understood. Uh, relatively little as well on the political economy of agriculture for nutrition policies, so there's been some work in that area, particularly in South Asia, uh, but very relatively um, poorly developed. Uh, the whole area of development of methodologies and metrics came out as a major gap um, that had been flagged earlier as well in the systematic review uh, that found that, uh, that, 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 that methodologies are, are, are very poor. We, we lack the metrics to really unpack um, nutritional outcomes on, on different groups. Um, population, uh, certainly as subgroups, um, particularly urban and, and male, uh, relatively neglected. Um, so the, the research has looked much more at uh, the younger age groups and women, uh, very little at uh, urban populations, peri-urban populations, and little understanding of the impact on, on males. Uh, another gap is around um, non-communicable diseases and the whole area around overnutrition and the dietary transition. So what is the relationship between agriculture and um, non-communicable diseases, um, obesity, uh, and, and what interventions are most effective uh, in, in that area? Uh, and finally, cost-effectiveness of interventions may be linked to that, that issue around methodologies and metrics, but there's very little on cost-effectiveness and different interventions in different settings. Um, so that, so that, that was where the, where the uh, gap analysis ended. Uh, we, we didn't want them to go further than that in terms of making recommendations because we felt it was uh, important that the analysis stood um, as an objective and, and research-based analysis. Um, but we've been looking uh, internally at how we would like to take this forward and I think we'd really welcome discussion and debate with others uh, on this. Um, there's quite a, a large, potentially large agenda there in, set out in that gap analysis. There's quite a lot of work going on, um, not particularly well coordinated. I think that the research community is not necessarily very well joined up in these areas, uh, but still, still quite large gaps. Uh, and there's three areas that we've identified um, uh, as areas where we would like to develop programs in the next six to eight months. Um, Based on, based on this. One, one is, is really trying to expand the evidence in this area, looking at, at programs and programmatic approaches to uh, impacting on, on nutrition through agriculture. And because of the weakness of the evidence base, um, we, we think that experimental trials or experimental design would be uh, an effective way to rapidly scale up the evidence in this area. So we'd be interested in developing a program using RCTs in particular to generate really robust, high quality evidence on, on what works. The second one uh, is, is really tackling that uh, policy gap um, and looking at the links between food and agricultural policy and nutrition outcomes but looking both at the undernutrition end of the spectrum as well as the over overnutrition part. And we see increasingly, even in low income countries, uh, that juxtaposition of overnutrition and undernutrition, often in the same families um, and um, in the same societies and communities. Uh, and the final area is around innovative tools and metrics. Uh, we'd like to commission some work that would provide relatively small amounts of money 
to researchers to stimulate the development of innovative tools and approaches to measuring impact, uh, but also bringing together researchers working in this area and ensuring that they're much more strongly joined up, um, sharing best practice on a regular basis. So I think we stop there um, and pass it back to you, Pascal, and, and, and open it up for discussion. Thank you very much. I also would like to thank the two presenters for the brief but very clear um, outlook. Um, I think the outlook is quite uh, positive um, because I think really research is going where it's supposed to go or where it was supposed to go, considering that, thanks God, uh, given the discussion who take place in the last 20, 30 years, has been mostly operational, uh, considering that uh, there are a lot of investment from the international community and from uh, different countries to face nutritional, uh, uh, nutritional emergency, uh, but not only emergency, but also chronic situation. So it's obvious that the emphasis is on the mother and the child, is uh, on, um, for example, the, the health um, uh, component and so on. So that one for me is is quite good. Um, uh, I have only two 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 further comments to make. Number one is to the conceptual framework. Uh, it's quite interesting conceptual framework, but probably um, I don't know. It doesn't fit me to others that I saw it. In the past, starting from the Iringa uh, expl uh, explanatory uh, framework, uh, which obviously was very much health basis. Uh, I think that uh, uh, practically there is too much in the framework presented today. Instead, it would be always good to try to find out which are the critical uh, determinants. Um, and um, I don't know if I can I can go back to the um, to the to the slide, but uh, I wonder why, uh, for example, uh, the care, uh, yeah, uh, health education status, healthcare and education, economic outcome, is considered as indirect. Uh, especially, for example, when we deal with uh, maternal and child uh, nutrition. That's it for the time being. I have further comments on uh, on uh, the gaps, but I think we can go later. Thank you very much. Um, a very good point, and I, I appreciate exactly what you're saying. I think the um, the research team that pulled this together. Uh, which included people like Corinna Hawkes, who've done a lot of work on, on frameworks in this sort of area, uh, decided that, uh, I mean, they looked at all the other frameworks that have been produced in the past and thought, well, you know, let's reconceptualize those a little. And I think I, I wouldn't get too caught up on the, on, the, uh, on the terminology direct and indirect. I mean, I agree with you entirely that obviously some of those things on the right-hand side, the health, education, the care, and all of those, are, very are going to have very direct impacts on nutritional status. And I agree with you. And of course, the UNICEF framework has them as direct, uh, directly underneath under nutrition. But I think what we wanted to do, what, what the team here wanted to do, was really demonstrate that the this is a framework from agriculture through to nutritional status, and that agriculture can have both direct, i.e. producing a more diverse and greater, greater amount of food, uh, that, uh, and that could directly lead to improved nutritional status, versus the more indirect route. And in fact, you know, the mapping here really tried to pull out where were the, where were the you know, who was doing what sort of research. And uh, the, the full mapping is available online on the DFID website. And it actually pulls out, it maps some of the research on these conceptual frameworks. And it shows that some research is looking at all of those boxes. Some research stops, goes from agricultural input down to the food environment, but doesn't then measure nutritional status. And a very, very little actually goes from agricultural inputs to the economic outcome and those sorts of routes. So really, was an, this, this conceptual framework really was an idea to help tease apart the various routes, the various ways in which agriculture might uh, impact nutritional status. So it's not meant to be, you know, this isn't, the, this isn't the, uh, the only way in which these things will, will interact, but really it was a tool to help the team uh, describe the research that's being done. 
I'm Terry Ballard from FAO, and I'm talking also on behalf of Anna Hereforth, who is listening but has no voice, so I'll speak for her too. Uh, we are, through funding from the European Union, uh, we are actually doing a very small project that builds upon this this uh, mapping and analysis of the of the gaps in collaboration with with Elsira and we've informed Alan and, and Rachel that we're doing this as well. And what we're looking at specifically is the gap that was identified in terms of the metrics and um, and somewhat also the study design of the ability to 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 achieve impact that they're me measuring with the metrics. And so we are um, actually, since the database has already been accumulated, uh, fortunately we can we can use that. We're starting with that and are going to try to contact the, the principal investigators of those projects that that are the 60% that Alan described that are really looking at, uh, have interventions that they're, they're measuring uh, the impact of doing evaluation of which. And we'd like to um, uh, e ask them to fill out a, a, a small survey that we're developing right now for the SurveyMonkey um, uh, online uh, survey service that would look at several different areas. One would be to look um, in detail at the indicators that they're using for this direct impact. So looking at the, the nutrition related indicators, food consumption, uh, nutritional status, both anthropometry and biochemistry chemistry, biochemical indices, and also any other indicators that they're using that has to do with nutrition. Uh, then we're going to ask in less de detail, but whether they're also measuring the, the factors that, that uh, have this indirect effect, like economic status, women's empowerment, uh, natural resource um, preservation. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Then we will ask. Um, we're asking them for each of the nutrition indicators if they can let us know what their targets are, what they're aiming for to be able to say that they've achieved impact. Um, which are the activities that are going to be contributing to achieving that impact? So a little very brief kind of log frame. Uh, and then we have a couple of questions on study design. Very simple. Just asking if they have a control group. Uh, and at what points are, are they measuring uh, the, the different indicators, beginning, middle, end, and are they doing that both on the intervention group and, and on a control group? Uh, our hope out of this project is to be able to um, uh, do an inventory of what people are using for MECT indicators that might be useful to other researchers, but also to to uh, maybe provide an opportunity for this research community or wider research community uh, to to go a little bit further into the issue, as, as Rachel was saying, to try to provide some support or, or guidance or, or 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 whatever, just to provide an opportunity for researchers to talk to each other to be able to improve the 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 metrics and the study designs that they're employing in order, order to d develop this evidence base. Thanks, Terry. That, that was really interesting to hear more on uh, what you're doing under that project. And I think it'd be really interesting to see the outcomes of that. Um, we'd, we'd be certainly interested to see how we can build on that um, in this idea of, of, of funding and supporting some further work to develop the metrics and to develop a kind of community of practice amongst researchers that's not linked to any of the big uh, kind of research programs, but supports I'm thinking, you know, USAID is, is funding work in this area. We, we ourselves have some, some programs, particularly in South Asia. Um, the CGIR's A4 Agriculture for Nutrition and Health is obviously a major investment in this area. But I think all of those programs recognize the need for um, greater um, links between the community's practice and more work on metrics. And it'd be really good to see how we can build on, on what you're doing there, Terry. I would, of course, uh, emphasize that the Commission is, is now uh, uh, working to scale up its work in, in nutrition and the uh, links between agriculture and nutrition. And in that context, we are looking at strengthening our research as well. Um, the, the, the comment I was going to make was about the evidence base. And um, obviously, I don't question the assumption that the evidence base is, is very weak. But I'd like to understand a bit better what are the deficiencies in in some of the case studies that are often quoted, such as the, um, the Harvest Plus work on biofortification, the uh, work of the Asian uh, Vegetable, sorry, the World Vegetable Center as they are now on, on leafy vegetables. 
Um, I mean, what 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 are the particular problems with this evidence? Is it insufficiently robust, or is it just uh, very limited in terms of, of quantity? Thanks. Maybe a note on the systematic review that um, DFID funded and that was published last year, looking at the evidence base. I think, I mean, it found a lot of small scale studies. It found um, many studies that lacked rigor in, in the methodology. Many had made assumptions about interventions leading to nutritional outcomes, but hadn't really tried to measure that in any systematic way. Um, there was a, a, a subsequent systematic review published this year, which found very much the same findings. But I think it's worth noting that particularly on biofortification, um, some of the more recent work, particularly on orange flesh sweet potato, based on um, a very large randomized control trial in Uganda and Mozambique, was published actually, uh, most of it was published this year. Um, so that wasn't captured in that original um, systematic review that's published in 2011. So I think there are some, some areas where um, evidence has been, uh, has started to, to come out, particularly on biofortification. Uh, that wasn't captured in those reviews. But nevertheless, I think it's quite significant sort of methodological weaknesses uh, and, um, and, and in scale of, of ambition in terms of collecting the evidence. But Alan, wanted. Yes, I mean, I think, you know, there's, there's two points to make uh, about the evidence base. Number one is that, as Rachel say, there is now emerging evidence from robust, uh, uh, you know, experimental studies, randomized control studies, rigorous research, which suggests, for example, that biofortified crops have a benefit both uh, to the increase the people who grow these things, grow these biofortified crops, especially orange fresh sweet potato, they, those households increase their consumption, and this has a biological benefit as well because it's shown to improve vitamin A status uh, in, in, in the children and the mothers and therefore reduce vitamin A deficiency. So that evidence is now coming out. Unfortunately, the majority of the research and, uh, that's been conducted up until now has been relatively small scale, and the, uh, uh, um, and the, this, the designs of the studies that have been used are not particularly robust. So there has been a, a, a focus on uncontrolled studies or studies with, uh, with, with uh, non-randomized studies, or before and after studies, and those are all fine, they're useful information, but it's not particularly robust. So the evidence base is, is lacking a rigor at the moment, um, and I think that the effort that's now going on, especially, you know, there's a big push now to improve the quality of this research, and I think that that will show lead to dividends, uh, but it will take a few years. So I think that's the, you know, the message is, you know, there are clear conceptual links between agriculture and nutrition and health. Uh, it's difficult to interrogate those links because some of those links are quite long and it might be difficult to show an impact uh, a long way down the line of an agricultural intervention. But, but, but you know, you're never going to show that impact if you have a poor quality study. So what you really need to be able to conduct rigorous research to really to interrogate whether or not agricultural inputs uh, can have uh, nutritional uh, benefits. And that, a lot of that work is currently underway. I think it reflects um, a weakness in, in evaluation practice in agriculture as a whole. It's not just on agriculture and nutrition. So, so it is in agriculture in general, but I think we see it very specifically in this area. And, 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 and agriculture and nutrition obviously has the additional challenge that you need to have researchers uh, who can cross the disciplinary boundaries between agriculture and nutrition. And so there's a real challenge in terms of bringing together um, health and nutrition people with agricultural pe people to design the right kinds of methodologies in this area. You said that, um, that, they, that you lack the metrics to measure nutritional outcomes in, um, if, that come from the agriculture side, if the agriculture inputs into the nutritional outputs. And then you also mentioned that in some families, there are some people that have, have enough food and others don't. Is that right? Do I understand that correct? Yep. Is that correct? You have, you have on the one hand, you can't really measure the nu nutritional 
outcome, but only the, then also you face the situation. Ah, okay, so all right. Yeah. So I see what you. So all right. So that's I see what you mean. So the so there are two things there, and they're quite distinct. The first thing is um, if I was doing a nutritional study uh, where I was giving a nutritional supplement, for example, it would be quite straightforward to measure the nutritional outcomes. If I was giving iron, I could measure iron measures of iron in, in the blood, for example. And so that measuring problem is not such a big one. When, you're, when, when the intervention is from a very different uh, sector, so an agricultural intervention, actually you have to think quite carefully about how you're going to measure the nutrition outcome. If you provide, uh, if you provide fish, for example, if, if the agricultural intervention is for fish ponds in a village, uh, what do you measure as your outcome? Do you measure the number of fish that are eaten? Do you remember? Do you measure iodine status in children? Do you measure the number of people who sell fish in the market? Those are the, so it's actually quite difficult to think through how you measure the outcome. So the other thing that Rachel mentioned was the um, was the fact that you know in some countries we have a double burden of overnutrition and undernutrition. So in the same household, uh, in the same community, and sometimes even in the same household, you will have overweight people and undernourished children. And that is, a, that is a real dichotomy. And understanding why that happens, how that happens, and how to prevent that is another area. And, and agriculture may have some inroads in there, but I don't think it's a necessarily the focal point of, of, of this sort of research uh, 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 track, I think. But in terms of the, the global donor platform looking into advocacy, this is obviously something that goes beyond your research, but it's certainly something that you need to advocate for, that you, it's a side outcome in a way that you need to look at. Yeah. So I'm a nutritionist um, and I'm obviously I'm interested in undernutrition but clearly there's a huge agenda on overnutrition um, and it's often the donor, donor community isn't that particularly interested in it because it's about overnutrition and the undernutrition questions are more pressing. But the overnutrition question is enormous and, uh, and, and there may well be some uh, a role for agriculture in addressing the overnutrition question. You know, what types of food are being produced uh, why are they being produced? What are the, what are the, what are, what are the drivers of the production of those crops? And so there may well be an important role for agriculture uh, and agricultural policies and agricultural development in, in tackling the, the problem of overnutrition. I wanted to follow up a bit, uh, maybe before going to the gaps, as I was suggesting. I wanted to leave space to discussion, but I was very much interested to uh, provide some comments on the gaps. So yeah, if after we can go back. Um, to the slide. Mm, you know, I wanted to follow up what uh, Radcliffe said before. Uh, now, um, I, I am, uh, I'm pleased of the, how the discussion is going now. We're speaking about the multi-faceted, the multi-dimension uh, um, type of research that we need in, in nutrition. Uh, thanks God, you know, the experience of the last 20 years uh, show us that we have to be extremely careful to translate results from the lab, uh, from the lab to the uh, to more, uh, you know, policy indication. Uh, like, you know, like, there are so many determinants that that enter in the field in the real situation that, you know, uh, I think there there are some some uh, some problem in uh, translating. So. I wanted to endorse that statement that has been doing. So if something come out from, for example, experiments on uh, on lab animals to translate directly, if not in a pure uh, biological uh, dimension, which is not enough in nutrition, uh, is not satisfying. Thank you. But again, if we can go to the slides on gaps, please. Just some comments about the, the, the first one, from agriculture to nutrition. Probably we have to say that if not from the sociological and uh, economic point of view, there is not much tradition of people working, for example, in the rural development or food security projects to have uh, you know, good hints uh, uh, on, on, uh, on nutritional uh, issues. Most of the tradition in the past, I believe, was uh, uh, again from the social and the health point of view. So it's very positive that now there is a growing attention also 
uh, from agriculture. About population subgroups, human males, I think there are data inside, it is available, but most of them, they are in a broader study where the nutrition uh, issue is only one of the components of a broader analysis. I can say many cases, like for example, uh, in, uh, in Addis Ababa, a study who was done by uh, Wolf Food Program roughly eight years ago, uh, was obviously broader, and, uh, but had a very clear indication also because of uh, the power of nutrition to define uh, specific and uh, uh, operational uh, uh, determining factors. So to know which group to, for example, to, uh, to assist or which type of a policy intervention was the most needed. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, Mario. We really struggled to, uh, to capture what what you're saying there. Um, I, I don't know if maybe there's something we can pick up on uh, on the instant message or maybe on the email. I just wanted to make a comment in terms of the follow up uh, uh, and the and the the projects or uh, initiatives that Rachel mentioned uh, towards the, uh, improving the evidence base. I just wanted to mention a resource that we've developed uh, an FAO that could be. Abuse to this to this uh, purpose. Uh, several years ago, we uh, produced an, an online self-paced e-learning course on impact assessment of, de of, of development programs on food security, and um, it, and then since then, uh, a number of, of tutored online courses have been given by by people that have been hired on behalf of FIO uh, to to take specific topics out of that, like uh, study design or log frame development. Or, or indicators or whatever, and, and working with, with groups in, in regions, and because of FAO's focus, is, it's been working with people in, in government institutions uh, to try to increase their capacity in this area. But the, um, these resources are available. Um, the online course is, of course, available to anybody, and the, the I mean, the, um, the self-paced one, but the online one, if, you know, if that's something that could be interest, interesting to you, we have our communications department that we can uh, have communication with you and, and let you know how, how we do this, how this carry out, what, what the success rate has been of that. Really interesting to hear about the online course, Terry. Um, sounds great. Um, just to add maybe to that, that DFID funded uh, the development of a distance learning course on nutrition last year, um, initially for internal use, but it's now been made publicly available through the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And that's accessible to anybody who wants to um, access the modules. Uh, and there are a couple of modules on specifically on agriculture and nutrition. I think there's a total of 17 modules now on, on different aspects of nutrition, but two of those are on agriculture and nutrition. Um, so we'd encourage people to use that as well. I think from our perspective, Pascal, that, that was uh, really useful. Um, I think it's a, a really challenging area, but there's huge momentum uh, built up in the international community around agriculture and nutrition. So we've got a great opportunity with um, international support for agriculture and interest in nutrition to really uh, move the evidence base ahead in this area. And I think in the next few years, we'll see, I'll see, we'll see a, a significant change in, 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 in what we know and understand about what really works in practice in the field. Thank you very much from our side. We'll just close the session now. I hope you enjoyed and you, uh, you can appreciate that this format is still a bit challenging for all, for all of us. And there are some more opportunities to do it better in the future, for sure. But I think for now, we just thank the two presenters for their excellent presentation and for the uh, good comments that will hopefully take the whole issue forward. Thank you very much.